Hey crew, it's your Captain Caliban here to remind you, if you haven't yet, you should sign up to follow our social media accounts on Facebook and Twitter. You can go to Facebook or Twitter at EIST Pod and like or subscribe to us there to get updates about the show. I also want to remind you that we are currently doing our giveaway promotion for a Star Trek Trivial Pursuit 50th anniversary set of cards complete with Galileo Shuttlecraft card holder. Ooh. And you are eligible for that if you go to iTunes, search for Enterprising Individuals, leave us a review and a rating. And you know, be honest, I wouldn't mind if it was high, but it's up to you. Once you do that, you will be entered into a chance to win the card set. So get to it. Subscribe to the show on iTunes so you get it as soon as it's ready. Rate and review us and get a chance to win a great prize. And let's get underway. It's worked so far, but we're not out. Yeah. I want to know what you're thinking There are some things you can't hide I want to know what you're feeling Tell me what's on your mind Hailing Frequencies Open, and welcome to Enterprising Individuals, the Star Trek discussion podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about the series, characters, and stories of the Star Trek universe. I'm your host, Caliban, and if you're wondering what could make someone flip out, accuse their co-workers of being murderers, beam down to a planet, leap through a time portal to 1930s Earth, let a guy blow himself up with your own phaser, and ultimately bring about the destruction of humanity by changing the outcome of World War II... Cordrazine is a hell of a drug. Probably it's heart medicine. So when the <laughs> right. doctor says, just take one, just take one. He's Don't OD on the heart medicine. Two drops for a flutter and no more. <laughs> well, I'm joined on this episode, as you can hear, by Kevin Lauderdale, who is an author, critic, and essayist, best known to Star Trek fans as a three-time contributor to the Strange New Worlds anthology series. He's also written essays and articles for outlets like the LA Times and McSweeney's Internet Tendency, and has contributed poetry to Andre Kodrescu's online literary magazine, Exquisite Corpse. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And am I the first person to point out how much I dig the Information Society clip you use at the beginning of the show? I think, I think you are, yes. There's not nearly enough new wave music in podcasting. Yes, uh, and as soon as they sue me, I'll take it down. But until <laughs> they do, we're going to keep using it. Uh, and you want to Duran Duran, then New Order. Yes, uh, right. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, permission to come aboard granted. Today we'll be talking about The City on the Edge of Forever, the 28th episode of the first season of Star Trek, the original series. An episode that needs no introduction, which means I should probably stop talking. But <laughs> I'm going to go on, and I can say that in preparing for our discussion, I found myself at a loss for what to say. And I think there's two reasons there. One, that this is an episode that is considered by many fans to be the best episode of Star Trek ever made. And consequently... Much ink has already been spilled about every aspect of this show. But also, too, it's it's really overwhelming how monolithic I think this stands, both as a key episode of Trek, but also as a cultural watershed of what sci-fi would come to look like in the second half of the 20th century and, and beyond. I mean, forget Cordrazine. This is tricky stuff. How do we do it justice? This is assuming, of course, that you agree that it's a pivotal episode? Absolutely. This is the big kahuna. And as I just said to you offline, frankly, I'd rather listen to somebody else more intelligent discuss it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Let's shut this off and go listen to exactly. uh, Bring it somebody right. else. Yeah, right. This is, this is the big one. Um, and it's got so many of the power chords of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's got time travel. It's got, I think it's the first time travel episode. It's got a strange alien device, the Guardian of Forever. It's got a little romance. It's got tragedy. Yes. It's, I think, the first possible, and one of certainly only a handful of episodes that ends down. It's oh, it's, yes, it's a total downer. Man. Um, and that appeals to you. I mean, this is a continuing series with characters that we love and short of killing them off. Um, right. How else are you going to get that pathos? Oh, absolutely. One, really rings it although technically i was never really i never really bought kirk's relationship with Edith keeler as, as the big one i'm more team miramane <laughs> okay all right sure so but it, it has become shorthand for the great love of kirk's life and you can see this in uh, short stories that have been written subsequent novels yeah yeah it, it's the point 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, we will touch on that a little later in the show. But first, your backstory. How did you become a Star Trek fan? How did you come to Star Trek? Oh, wow. So I grew up in Los Angeles in the late 60s and 1970s. And Star Trek was on Channel 5, 6 p.m. in reruns every night and I think twice on the weekends. Mm. And so I and my family was a good geek family. I mean, probably one of the proto geek families. And I watched <laughs> every single year over and over and over. And I really enjoyed it. I bought the novels and the novels came out when next gen came along in college, me and my buddies would sit around and we'd all watch that. And surprisingly, I never really wrote fan fiction. I was aware such things existed. I'd go to conventions and I'd see people's bound, you know, novels that they'd written and typed up and photocopied or mimeographed. (laughs) Wow. And, uh, And what I now came to realize is these strange covers with Kirk and Spock bare chested, very close to each other. Right. <laughs> other kinds of stories. But yeah, they, right. That never really interested me. Then comes the internet. And I would be on news groups. I don't know if, I don't know what your target audience is here, but news groups, all like alt writing track or stuff like that. These were early forms of bulletin boards. Right. It was uh, uh, web pages, folks. And careful how you say alt right. <laughs> after that. Uh, and I remember specifically when in the mid 90s, a new editor took over at Pocket Books named John Ordover, mm. who's been mentioned by various previous writers on your show before. Right. And I remember his, his subject line was new Star Trek editor says hello. And I clicked on it. He says, Hi, I'm John Ordover. I'm going to be doing this, this, this. And he really did change Star Trek novels and the anthologies. He brought in all kinds of new ideas. And one of the new ideas was the Strange New Worlds contest, right. which was. But fans, non-professional writers, could write short stories and send them in. It had never occurred to me to write before because there was no place to really sell it. Let's face it, I'm mercenary at heart. But once <laughs> this came along, and it was like, oh, we can write this. It'll be professionally published. It's approved by Pocket Books and I guess then Paramount. And they were paying the munificent sum of 10 cents a word, which doesn't sound like much. But believe me, if you've tried to sell it, and you're lucky if you, for some indie anthology to get a free copy of the book. <laughs> right. you know, three cents a word is like practically industry standard. I think that's less than Asimov got in the 1930s. Wow. Professional rate to be um, a member of SFWA, Science Fiction Writers of America, is mm-hmm. I think it's either five or six cents. Okay. And they were paying us 10 cents a word. So anyway, so uh, this was like 1999. And I sat down and I wrote a great story. As a matter of fact, it involved The Guardian of Forever. It was a Deep Space Nine story. And it got rejected. And I said, okay. And so I wrote a story for Strange New Worlds 2 in 2000. And that got rejected. And Strange New Worlds 3 and 4 and 5. In 6, I sent in a story and I got back the Holy Grail. The, the semi-Holy Grail. Uh, Holy Grail would be acceptance. A note from Dean Wesley Smith, the editor. Dean was very prominent on the internet. He would post things like, you know, here's... 10 things not to do with your Strange New World story. Sure. Don't begin with the character waking up. Don't begin with the character bored. And he say, you know, sometimes I will put a little note. Pay attention to the note, he said. And so I got back um, what eventually became my first story, A Test of Character, which was about how Kirk rewired the Kobayashi Maru computer. I always thought that there, were, there had been other explanations, like in books and other stories. And I always thought those were unsatisfactory because they still involved him cheating Right. Uh, my st- solution was he simply removed the things that made sure you, you were guaranteed to lose. Okay. Giving himself a level playing for- field. Anyway, I get it back, and there's a note that says, story just trails off at the end. And in retrospect, he was right. So I took his advice. Would-be readers out there, don't be so wedded to your prose that when an editor says, here's how you can fix it, and then I'll buy it, <laughs> you don't do that. Oh, we're going to talk about editing in a bit, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that, and I, he, he was right. So I add like another page and a half sent it in. I remember it clearly. <laughs> it was a late December day, perhaps early January, and my phone rings. And sometimes my job, I had to take messages for people. And the phone rings. It's a number I don't recognize. So I pick it up. The voice says, hi, this is John Ordover. And I start writing down on one of those little pink pads. You know, John Ordover. And I go, oh, my God. He says, hi, is this Kevin? Yeah, I've got good news for you. You just sold a test of character to Strange New Worlds. And I was, oh, it was amazing. The first thing I did was I called my wife. Then I called my mom. And then I made an opportunity for myself. Also on these bulletin boards was Marco Palmieri, who was assistant editor at Pocket Books for Star Trek. He later went on to become chief editor, and now he's an editor at Tor. 
And he'd been talking about how there were going to be anthologies for a couple of anniversaries for series. I think that Next Gen was going to have its 30th anniversary, and like the next year was going to be uh, the 25th anniversary, mm-hmm. or th- things, things along those lines. He sa- said it's going to be sort of invitation only. Well, here's another piece of writing advice for folks. If something is invitation only, see if you can't get yourself invited. Right. <laughs> so with one professional sale, this is my first professional sale on pretty much any piece of fiction. I don't think I'd ever sold a piece of fiction before. Um, I sent him an email. Dear Mr. Palmieri, my name is Kevin Lauderdale. I've just sold a story to Strange New World 7. When the time comes for you to solicit um, pitches for the original series anthology, which is coming up in a couple of years, I'd appreciate being invited. And he sent me a, bet, note, a note back and said, Dear Kevin, yeah, I'd be happy to add your name to the, and I remember this phrase, increasingly lengthy <laughs> list of people who would like to be approached. <laughs> and a couple of years later, he did indeed send me um, an invite, and we can talk about that later on. So then I sent some stories in for Strange New Worlds 8, and one of those was accepted, um, a story called Assignment 1, which is about Gary Seven. Mm. saving Captain Christopher from 9-11. It was actually a really <laughs> strange and weird idea. It's like, I had this, I mean, 9-11 had happened four years earlier. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I had, what about this? What about that? It's kind of a daring and weird situation. Yeah, go for it, sure. Situation. But I sent it in. That's another, the job of the editors is to pick the stories. If they don't like it, they'll reject it. Right. And Dean Leslie Smith was really open about the editing process to us. I once asked, oh, you know, how many stories do you get? Oh, I get like 10,000 stories. I said, oh, my God, you read 10,000 short stories every year? He said, no. I read the first two pages of 10,000 short stories Okay, yeah. this contest. And if you don't grab me, sometimes I skip to the end, but it's off. Yeah. Um, I sent a couple more stories in for Strange New Worlds 9, and one of those sold. It was called The Rules of War, which takes place during the eugenics wars. It's um, Captain... Nathan Archer's, I think, great grandfather. There was a throwaway line in the episode of Enterprise where he talks about something that happened during New Jack's Wars. And I spun a story out of that. Sure. Um, and about a month later, um, Star Trek Constellations, which was the anniversary for TOS, came out. And my work with Marco Palmieri was really interesting. He had said, you know, I was, that book, that anthology has a lot of, you know, quote unquote, real writers and people who've been doing Star Trek novels for years, uh, people like Dayton Ward and Kevin Dilmore. Dayton, of course, had done, you know, had stories like the first three Strange New Worlds had been invited to do novels. The right, right. Wardy is named after him. It's somebody who got three stories. Yeah, I've been trying to, I've been compiling a list of the Wardy recipients we've had on the program, of which, of course, you're one of them. So uh, I've been thinking about uh, when I have a contributor who has hit three shows, maybe we'll retire <laughs> them and name an award after them. And at this point where it's 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 uh, neck and neck between uh, a Mackie and a Pearsony right now. <laughs> so along with quote unquote professionals, although technically I was now a professional, three sales, and sure. that's what's got me into SFWA, three professional sales at the professional rate. Um, I don't know if you did this with everybody, but Marco said, okay, give me three one paragraph pitches. I sent those in. He sent me back a note saying, okay, none of these grabbed me. I liked the first sentence of the last one, <laughs> which was um, Spock at um, a place called I called The Yard, which was my idea of where Starfleet stores all of its alien technology that it studies. Okay. Um, but the rest of it, I, you know, give me a different story with that character in that setting. So I sent him another idea. And he said, okay, this is good. This is a good paragraph. Give me a three-paragraph version of the story. That's why I sent that to him. He sent it back. He said, okay, give me a three-page version of the story. I sent that back. He said, okay, now you can write the story. Huh. So I wrote the story. This is my favorite story. <laughs> he, then, he then calls me up. He said, you got time? <laughs> and we spent about an hour going through everything I'd done wrong in the story. Okay. The most productive meeting I have ever had. I'm sure. But it's like, first of all, originally the yard was going to be a sort of holographic projection of a planet with its disguise. It was, have you established that this planet is in orbit around a sun somewhere? I'm like, <laughs> no. Right. I decided to make it like just a blackness, a void. Okay. Anyway, so that was my professional Star Trek writing. I, I it never even occurred to me to do it until you could get paid. And then once you could get paid, I kept on plugging away after rejection, after rejection, after rejection. Yeah. And then I made it. That's it's so fascinating that they would help you kind of massage it so much. I mean, after you said that, you know, they read the first couple of pages and if it's not going to work, then they toss it. But they must have had a lot of faith in you to kind of keep going back and helping you kind of develop those ideas. 
I, yeah, I really appreciate the effort that Marco put into this. I know that several people, I talked to several people who sent in pitches. Marco just said, nah, none of these work for me. Okay. So I appreciate, I really appreciate the fact that he saw at least a spark of something. And if I hadn't been able to pull it off, I'm sure he would have just said, I'm sorry, it just, just isn't working. That's just right. And that's the way it goes. It's a business. That's right. It's somebody else's sand, sandbox. I'm playing with their rules in their universe. And if I can't pull it off, that's true. I pull it off. Well, in addition to being a writer, you're a podcaster yourself. Can you talk about your broadcasting history? Oh, wow. Sure. Um, so one of the really neat things about Strange New Worlds, the anthology, is that I got to know so many people. And for a while, I live in Northern Virginia, and there was like a pod, maybe 10 people from Northern Virginia who all made it into Strange New Worlds. <laughs> um, and a lot of us would meet at um, the Shore Leave Convention, which is held in Southern Maryland every year. Sure. And there would be a huge – called the Writer's Alley, I think it was. And there would be Peter David. And there would be Bob Greenberger. And they treated us, short story writers, with as much respect as those fellows. There would be a dozen people who just had stories in Strange New Worlds. And we'd get free admission, professional, you know, guest passes, the whole shebang. And people would buy – bring their copies of Strange New Worlds in for us to sign. And so I met – a whole bunch of people. That's where I first met Scott Pearson. That's where I first met uh, Dayton Ward. Uh, that's where I first met a fellow named John Drew. John Drew runs the Chronic Rift Podcast Network. Sure, right. Which I was only vaguely aware of because I followed Keith the Candido's blog. And he'd talk about, oh, we just did an episode of uh, the Chronic Rift. And, all that. and so I think I'd listened to two of them. I didn't even notice. I was sitting right next to John Drew for like three hours during the signing. He had a story in um, Not Strange to Worlds, but in a really wonderful Doctor Who collection. He was signing stuff, and he was talking to people about podcasting. And eventually, I like, just turned to him and said, God, I know your voice. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm, I'm John Drew. Like, even though his name was on the little tent there, I, said, I didn't even connect it. It's <laughs> like, yes, I've heard you. I've heard you with Keith on, <laughs> on your show. Yeah. And he said, yeah, sure. Oh, you're Kevin. Yeah. And so we talked a little bit and he invited me to be on a show talking about strange new worlds and things like that. An episode of the chronic rift. And then he said, yeah, so that was fun. Would you like to be on another one? We're talking about Sherlock Holmes later on. And I was on the Sherlock Holmes one. I did not particularly equip myself well, but anyway, <laughs> but I came to listen to his show. I'd be on every now and then he'd invite me on just to, if I have anything interesting to say. I mean, I think he was desperate for content really, but uh, I understand. But he and I became sort of, sort of friends. And, um, at one point he found out I was a big fan of old time radio and of mm. just pop culture events. So he said, would you like to do a sort of a pop culture podcast you just talk about whatever you want you know 15 minutes 20 minutes whatever and so i did one for a while called it has come to my attention which was just me talking about interesting things like isaac asimov's autobiography an interesting thing lots of people don't know about or um one of my favorite ones that perhaps your listeners would enjoy is i did a piece about star trek things that aren't star trek so like you know the obvious thing is uh galaxy quest right sure (laughs) but my pitch was more um the book The Moat in God's Eye by Larry Niven and Jerry Purnell is the, the best Star Trek novel. And uh, <laughs> uh, the, the film Master and Commander, based on Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey Matron books, is the best Star Trek movie and things like that. Sure. Well, eventually I got tired of this. And I was like, you know, that's, I've said all I had to say. And he said, well, look, I host, as you probably know, this old-time radio podcast on the network. Where I just basically present old-time radio shows, 15 minutes, Superman's, half-hour – Jack Benny comedies, things like that. And he goes, and, but I am just got too busy. I, he was taking classes for his master's degree in teaching and stuff like that. And he said, I'd really hate – see, this is the one show I'd really hate to see go away. Would you be willing to take over? And you can just do whatever you want as an old-time radio podcast. So I said, yes, I'm a massive fan of old-time radio. And thanks to the internet, it's all available pretty much uh, in usually pretty good quality. And it's all copyright-free. It's all public domain, non-copyright. So I didn't feel guilty – stealing stuff from the 30s 40s and 50s right <laughs> and so what i do is every episode occasionally there's an hour-long one where i'll present something like the lux radio theater where they did a one-hour adaptation of meet me in st louis or something i try to do a drama and a comedy so i'll do dragnet or have gun will travel and i'll do jack benny or the old bob hope show but what i do is i present annotations up front i try not to spoil the jokes but i'm going to say alf london Alf London? 
was Alf Landon was the fellow who ran against FDR the last time he got one electoral vote. Uh, there's a reference in this show to, you know, Milady Soap. Milady Soap advertised itself as the soap that sanctifies. You know, something like that. So <laughs> right. when you hear a joke, you'll, you'll have just enough information to get the really more obscure jokes. Sure, sure. So that's why I do in podcasting. I'm also, and also through that network, social media works, friends. I am an introvert, but social media and podcasting and Star Trek conventions work. <laughs> I've had a wonderful fellow named Dan Persons, who used to be on the Cine Fantastique podcast talking about movies. And at one point, he made a passing reference to Birdemic. <laughs> probably one of the worst films ever made and i jumped on netflix and i watched it and i sent him an email i said oh my god you're right we should do like a one-off podcast about this and he invited <clears throat> our friend andrew lipinski to join and we did a three person we had so much fun talking about this horrible movie dan said we should just do a bad movie podcast because as everybody knows there's no other bad movie podcast on the internet. Oh, no, no. It's a completely open field. We sure. filled the niche, my friend. Yes. <laughs> so it's, um, we've had some troubles, technical problems on and off. Uh, it's called Temple of Bad. I think there's templeofbad.com. If you subscribe to the Chronic Rift Network on iTunes, you will get all of these things and more as they come out. Yeah, I can't recommend Chronic Rift highly enough. And specifically, I want to recommend, um, you mentioned before, Scott Pearson, friend of the show, has a show with his daughter called Generations Geek, where they talk about geek issues and do sort of theme-based episodes about different things in the geek sphere. And they interview people, writers and friends. And uh, you should check that out as well. And me and my daughter. We talked about The Hobbit with him. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Scott is a great guy. And that is a brilliant idea. I wish I had thought of that. Yeah, I wish I had a daughter to do that with. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, rule number one, never send anybody to a different podcast. Uh, so stay with <laughs> this podcast right now. Uh, have you written or, or spoken about this episode previously? No, I haven't. You want to, should I talk about why I wanted to do this one? Yeah, please tell me. All right, so do that. I have to go back to Los Angeles in the 1970s and give you my Harlan Ellison bona fides. Oh, boy. Okay, I can't wait. Uh, <laughs> okay, so just to set the audience up, uh, we're going to talk about Harlan Ellison. Clearly, uh, he's the writer of this episode. He's come up before on the show a couple times, and I feel like every time everybody's pulled back just a little bit uh, for reasons that you'll probably find out in the course of this episode. But I've I've been waiting for a good Harlan Ellison story, so please lay it on me. So – i watching Star Trek, and I, I, I was interested in writing, interested in words. I would pay attention to the credits. I would see who wrote, and I would see Ted Sturgeon. I would see Norman Spinrad. I would see Harlan Ellison. Mm. And sometimes these names meant things to me, and sometimes they didn't. But growing up in the 70s in Los Angeles, where Mr. Ellison lives, I would start to see his name other places. Reviews in the Comics Journal. Um, articles in LA Weekly, um, in the Los Angeles Magazine. I would hear him on a wonderful radio show called Hour 25, which was on KPFK, the Pacifica station in Los Angeles. He was a frequent guest, and I became captivated by him as a storyteller. Um, I appreciate his fiction, but I really love his nonfiction, and him live is an electrifying event. He is a raconteur, my friends. <laughs> you can get um, from Deep Shag Records um, CDs of a lot of his live presentations, a lot of his live Q&As him reading stories, him telling about his adventures as a writer. They are amazing. So I came to be a really big Harlan Ellison fan. In fact, when the host of Hour 25, Mike Hodell, died um, much too young, Mr. Ellison took over for a year as host. And so over that year, I really, really became a massive Harlan Ellison fan. So I'm going along. And in 1995, this book is published called Harlan Ellison's The City on the Edge of Forever, the original teleplay that became the classic Star Trek episode. Right. And I pick it up, and I'm like, what is this? There's, like, some other script? I knew, <laughs> oh, for boy. somebody who grew up in Los Angeles, I knew nothing about how film and TV worked. Sure. <laughs> so I figured, you wrote a script, you know, if it got published, it got, if it got produced, it got produced, and there you go. Right. I had no idea that the crux of all of this Sturm and Drang is the fact that his episode was rewritten numerous times. But here's the thing. Everybody's episode was rewritten constantly. Oh, sure. This was a brand new TV show. And especially the first season, especially a sophisticated science fiction show. It's not like it was another Western. And the producers might go to the would-be writer. Uh, there's a sheriff. There's a lady who runs the saloon. Every week a bad guy comes into town. Right. Go. 
Yeah. So nobody knew what Star Trek sounded like. Yeah. And so in reading this, I see Ellison's original ideas, which included things like a firing squad. Right. Um, um, the guardians of forever, actual people who guard the time, the time portal and things like that. And yeah. I see how things were rewritten. And I see this amazing, I think it's 40 or 50,000 word prologue by Mr. Ellison talking about all the things that happened and all the things that have happened subsequently. And so I became completely amazed by this. And then just a couple of years ago, Mark Cushman put out These Are the Voyages. Right. A series of books which are as close as you will get to going through the Guardian of Forever and being on the set when the original series was being made. Absolutely fantastic. And I find I read the article on City there, and I find that you know, the average episode may have gotten rewritten six, seven times, and Ellison's was, went through the typewriter about 18 times. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so when you approached me, I first thought, you know, I don't really have much to say about anything in particular. And then it occurred to me, no, I do. I've been following one particular writer, and as it happens, one particular episode for literally decades now. Yeah. And, oh, on top of that, just came out. Um, last year, a full-scale dramatic reading, like a radio drama version of that book with Ellison's essay, and actors like LeVar Burton and yes. David Gerald, other people like that, doing voices, acting out the original version of it. So there's just so much to see and find out about. And I said, you know what? You know, as much as I'd like to hear a real pro talking about it, I think I actually might have something to say about this. Uh, let's get right into the details here so we can continue to discuss this. It is the City on the Edge of Forever, the 20th episode of the first season of the original series. It first aired on April 6th, 1967. Uh, as we said, it was written by Harlan Ellison, directed by veteran director of the original series, Joseph Pevney. And there's no star date given for this episode, although uh, B. Joe Trimble did conjecture a star date of 3134.0 for the episode's entry in the Star Trek Concordance. And she sort of um, just gleaned that from Ellison's original teleplay. Kevin, your assignment, if you can, is to give us a 25-word synopsis of The City on the Edge of Forever. <clears throat> Ahem. McCoy disrupts the past, erasing the Federation. Kirk and Spock must ensure an innocent woman's death to save the future. All right. Give me a 10-page treatment on that. <laughs> Sounds good. No, no, I like it. I agree. <laughs> it would be a great story. <laughs> and that, that's the thing. I really want to see off the top of the bat. It was always a great story. No matter how many rewrites, the crux is always there. That Those key points are always there. Yes. It was always going to be something that you had not seen before. Yeah, and I think everybody at every point in this, no matter how contentious it got, recognized that. That's why they stuck with it for so long. Mm -hmm. I mean, this took 10 months to get just from the initial pitch to, to the screen, which is not the way things were really done back then, or even now. It's hard when you're trying to produce a weekly show to have a to have like you know the th third slot, right? <laughs> Game pushed to the fifth slot, yeah, and the sixth slot, and yeah. the eighth slot, and some of that, Mr. Ellison admits, was his being a little bit late on turning things in. He was extremely busy, and also there was a lot of other stuff going on. The original script would be an amazing episode of The Outer Limits. Oh yeah, sure, sure. It was just not particularly Star Trek y. And yeah. that's nobody's fault, as I said before. I mean, he's writing a script. The show hadn't even aired yet. He didn't know. Right. I mean, there's like a Bible and you're working from that. Right. And so he produced a very Ellison ish vision of the future, but it just wasn't Star Trek enough. And so Roddenberry gave him some notes and it had the, this, yeah. this was rewritten and that was, and eventually other people rewrote it. What was finally produced was. Gee, your editor's or your producer's vision of the future. Yeah, and it's amazing how that itself, from that outside perspective and so many people involved in it, sort of became Star Trek. Um, traditionally in the show, this is the part where I provide some interesting facts, but there's a lot of facts about City, and they're all devastatingly interesting, and I'm sure we're going to hit a lot of them as we talk about the show, but I, I did want to hit a few tidbits first. Um, this was the most expensive episode to shoot of the original series outside of the two pilots. Its overall cost was... Uh, according to Memory Alpha, $245,316, which was significantly more than the $191,000 originally budgeted. Uh, a lot of that was due to the ambitious nature of the script. Uh, Roddenberry himself claimed that it might have cost an additional 200000 on top of that to film it as written. 
Uh, it did win the 1968 Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation. It'd be another 25 years before a TV show would do that again. And that would be Star Trek The Next Generation, the episode The Inner Light. Uh, the final line of the episode where Kirk bitterly exclaims, let's get the hell out of here, was very controversial with the network. And it marks the first time that the word hell was used as an expletive on Star Trek. Uh, the Guardian of Forever, of course, is central to this episode, and it's an enduring element that's appeared in tie-in media like Peter David's 1992 novel Imzadi, uh, also in the Star Trek animated series episode yesteryear, uh, which we've discussed previously on the show. But it would never again feature in any live-action episode of Star Trek, which I think is disappointing, although the implications of its use, as we see, are very grave. Um, when Kirk says, when, when the Guardian says, hey, where do you want to go now? And he's like, yeah, let's get the hell out of here. It yeah. doesn't seem like you're going to come back there anytime soon, although I do love uh, D- DC Fontana's uh, Yesteryear. It's a god device. It's, it's almost mm-hmm. too powerful to actually use. And in some novels, uh, it's used, but usually generally, you know, it's a, a thing of last resort or it's used as the Guardian itself wants itself to be used. Right, right. It's it's a really – it's such a powerful device. It, it, it would be your go-to. It would be your default all the time. It's like, eh, let's just not do that. Right. Uh, the Next Generation episode, Yesterday's Enterprise, uh, also discussed previously on this show, was originally drafted to feature a return of the Guardian in which Sarek and a team of Vulcan researchers would travel to ancient Vulcan and they'd accidentally somehow cause the death of Surak, which would require Sarek to remain in the past and assume his role in Vulcan history, which I'd have to imagine would be benefited by the fact that their names are so freaking similar. <laughs> <laughs> this plot line is similar to the two-part uh, Deep Space Nine episode, Past Tense, which we've also discussed on this show. Geez, we get around. Uh, where Commander Sisko has to take on the historical role of a man who was inadvertently killed in the past. And a reference to City is included in Past Tense, when a boxing poster advertising a rematch between boxers Kid McCook and Mike Mason can be seen, which is similar to a poster seen in this episode of City. And you have to imagine that... I, past tense probably began its life as a pitch to return to the Guardian. <laughs> I could just see somebody being like, okay, get this. You're in the Defiant. Cisco and the crew go to this planet, and they're going to get in the thing. What's interesting, that, that brings up something. I was just thinking also not involving a time travel device. Is this, um, aside from like a naturally occurring rip in the space-time continuum, is this the only, certainly in Star Trek, time travel th- tool that is not strictly speaking a machine is it i can't even think of like another another science fiction universe that has something that's not cl- clearly a machine time the time machine time tunnel mm-hmm. this is like a living entity that again was an original idea through ellison's i mean originally it was uh it was a, a porthole a, a beam of light right and yeah and outside of just the, the time travel sort of um, implications of, of things like wormholes and naturally occurring phenomena. I think you, you're probably right about that. That's really interesting. When you were talking, just going off another tangent real fast, um, sure. I heard listened to your episode of uh, Time Zero. Yes. And I remember you talking with the guests about how it seemed to present a deterministic view of time where things, everything in the past has already happened. It's just waiting for you to catch up with it. Yeah. And I did want to ask you about that. Um, whenever we talk about time travel on the show, I like to quiz uh, guests um, who are creatives usually uh, about their sort of theory, their favorite way to apply time travel, their favorite flavor, if you will, because it can be done a lot of different ways. This, in this universe, in this particular story, things are so much more fluid. It's not deterministic at all. Um, think about this. There are actually three timelines. There's the regular timeline. Mm. McCoy g- goes back and saves the Keeler, and that creates the timeline that our characters are living in, where there's no universe, where there's no inter- federation. Right. And then our characters go back, and they're not just inter- – they're, they're now there when McCoy would have saved her. So there's a, it's a third timeline that's shot off. Things are constantly in motion. Nothing is set. The future, the past is very malleable. For being on TV in the 60s, I think that would be something very uh, arresting for a, a viewer to see that – uh, all you have to do is have this guy jump through the thing and then suddenly Earth is gone or at least the Federation and, and f- the future as we know it, it has been changed. This is – I mean this is – Star Trek – everybody's oh, Star Trek was innovative and yes, it was. Um, a lot of episodes were still sort of – especially first season kind of monster of the week. But this episode threw so many things at people at, yeah. even, at, even as produced. There's the incredibly sad ending. There's the concept of – Simple time travel. Um, the, the idea of time travel to make sure something bad happens. 
that's that's the thing that really get that's for me is Ellison's brilliance right there. Usually, if you have a time travel story, it's I have to go back and make sure something good happens. Uh, oh no, Marty's parents didn't meet. I'd better make sure they meet. <laughs> so I'm going to fade into nothingness. Or oh no, McCoy went back in time. If, in the hands of somebody lesser or lesser writer, McCoy would have gone back in time and stopped Hitler from dying, and would have had to be we have to go back and make sure Hitler dies because that count that as a good thing. But right. this is an instance where you have to go back and make sure a very good person dies. Yeah, it's it's the reverse. I mean, it, it's yeah. it's uh, killing uh, baby uh, Mother Teresa or something like that instead. In Ellison's original script, it wasn't McCoy who went back in time. It was somebody else, uh, uh, actually a murderer and a drug dealer. Um, right. Yeah. But I think that by having it be McCoy, somebody who you are more emotionally invested in, and somebody who is himself a good person, even if he's under the effect of uh, heart medicine, <laughs> to have somebody you care about and somebody who's good go back and do a good thing and have that be the thing right. that causes destruction. It's yeah. not somebody going back and doing something bad. Uh, writers, would-be writers, need to find that reverse. Yeah, find, find that point where it's the unexpected. And this story gives you unexpected and then another unexpected and then Kirk falls in love with her. That's unexpected. Right. And that, <laughs> there's just so many twists of the unexpected story structure here is great. Yeah, it's dense. One more thing about The Guardian of Forever. It was designed by the show's first art director, Roland M. Brooks. Normally at that point on the show, set design duties were delegated to his subordinate, the future art director, Matt Jeffries, for whom the Jeffries tubes are named. But Jeffries was out sick when the episode was being designed. So Brooks came up with the now iconic space donut design of The Guardian. And according to DC Fontana, when Jeffries returned to work, his reaction was, what the hell is this? Uh... Which is not, I'm guessing, uh, the first time that the expletive of hell was used <laughs> in the production of an episode. The footage seen of earlier ages in Earth's history through The Guardian, which is rendered in black and white, of course, is archival footage from old Paramount films, which I thought was interesting. And the episode was shot on the famed 40 Acres set, where many shows and films of the era were shot, notably the Andy Griffith show and the original series episodes Return of the Archons and Miri, which has also been discussed on this show previously. And if you look closely, I think you can see Floyd's Barbershop. I sign. believe they do walk by it, yes. I think they do. do, 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 do. <laughs> hey, Opie. Hey, Andy. Uh, right. Great. You, yeah, you, the reason – this is actually – I love this. So one of the complaints about Ellison's script was that people could view – you know, they'd see scenes of the past right. through – and Ellison had like mastodons and this and that. And somebody was like, if we film this, that's going to cost us an extra hundred thousand dollars. Right. So somebody had the very clever idea of just using stock footage. It's right. already been filmed. I know. Yeah. Right. And I love that it's in black and white too, because I guess the uh, guardian doesn't have color uh, reception. Um, I also like later how, when Spock's looking through his little doohickey that he makes in the hotel room, like it sees newspapers. Cause of course that's it. That's what it does. I think they had microfilm or microfish. Yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> He's accessing the microfish reels. So let's – okay, we're done with that. Uh, let's, okay. let's talk about Harlan Ellison. Uh, like you said before, you were a fan of his. Uh, you mentioned you know, him uh, being live and, and hearing his nonfiction. Were you influenced by his fiction growing up as well? Um, not as much. I found it <laughs> – this is more about me than him. I found some of it rather challenging. Uh-huh. Although as I got older, which is, which is what he's supposed to do. That is the man's job is, I, is to bring you new and different ideas and yeah. to challenge your thought. Um, there's a reason why he's one of the most awarded writers in the history of science fiction. Um, I view some of his later stuff uh, as I got older. I was really able to appreciate it. Um, I think Paladin of the Last Hour, which is about two men mm. and a clock which can stop time as it mm. happens, is absolutely amazing. It was dramatized on the uh, revived version of The Twilight Zone. Okay. Um, also, he has a story called Mephisto in Onyx, mm-hmm. which is about a serial, serial killer who can jump from person to person. Two of the best things you'll ever read. Absolutely amazing. Sure. But no, my fiction is not nearly as um, – I think it's more prosaic. He okay. is amazing at drawing word pictures. In fact, one of the most fun things about reading or listening to the script, his original script, is the way he describes things. Yeah. It's like the planet isn't just you know, a dull planet. It's like a planet flicked – from the finger of a god, the dull ember that burns in the sky. Sure. His writing, his descriptions of things, yeah. is energetic and fascinating. Even the city on the edge of forever, that phrase just comes from an original draft where Kirk sees this city where the guardians are, and he sort of describes it as, as the city on the edge of forever. Yeah, that was something that, I, growing up, I never really got. I figured, is New York the city on the edge of forever? Uh, kind of, yeah. I think that sort of applies to whether that was intentional or not. I think there's a parallel there, sure. 
Okay, they kept that title but didn't apply to the thing that Ellison originally envisioned. For my part, I was certainly influenced, I think, by the influence that he affected on the world of sci-fi. But I can't say that I've read the lion's share of his work, uh, or at least when I was a kid, um, apart from the required reading like I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream or Repent Harlequin. I, I think as a young kid with a library card and a dream and no awareness of the hierarchy in genre fiction, I'd be much more likely to pull down a from the shelf a book with a robot on the cover and it says i robot it's, it's right there he's telling you he's a robot that seems kind of cool um things like that rather than trying to dig up brian aldis anthologies or short story collections or, or reading um sci-fi periodical magazines yeah um, or what what is a book called dangerous visions what does that mean it doesn't mean anything to like a 10 11 or 12 year old right me. Yeah, yeah when i read it in college even then it was groundbreaking i'm like oh my god these are stories that bend my mind these are stories that really take me to other uses of science fiction. It really did open up science fiction. Yeah, and certainly his adaptations or the adaptations of his work made their way to me through Star Trek, The Outer Limits, A Boy and His Dog, even the uh, Canadian sci-fi TV series, The Star Lost, which I love to bring up whenever I can for some reason. I don't know. Nobody's ever heard of it, but... Is that the one where he basically got screwed out of everything and had to sue people for oh <laughs> there's only one <laughs> uh, i should mention for any listeners that don't know uh, who haven't figured it out yet that ellison is by his own admission the most contentious person on earth and he's had at one point or another a falling out with almost everybody it seems like he's ever collaborated with often culminating in legal action and his work with uh, desilu and paramount and roddenberry is no exception this episode, as we mentioned before, had a somewhat tortured path to the screen. It took 10 months from the time that it was commissioned to the point where they had a final shooting script. And as you had mentioned, it was rewritten many, many times. And it seems like it went through the hands of just about everybody on the writing staff before they got there. As we've talked about before on the show, early in the development of Trek, uh, Roddenberry had reached out to many of the respected sci-fi authors at the time and solicited scripts and ideas from them, people like Ellison, Richard Matheson, Asimov, Philip Jose Farmer. And although only a few episodes were produced from those scripts, many of those ideas helped shape what Trek would become. It, it's like you mentioned, uh, nobody knew re- what Trek looked like, and all these things sort of formed this kind of gestalt that went forward. Uh, Roddenberry wanted Ell- Ellison specifically because one of his scripts for The Outer Limits had been nominated for a Writers Guild Award. I think that was The Demon with the Glass Hand. And it had won. And it, did, and it won, exactly, yeah. And so after pitching his idea in March of 66, he, Ellison, submitted his first script treatment a week later. And as you had said also before, he was writing at a time before there was a series Bible. Uh, So many of the iconic elements of Trek hadn't been established. And his script was a lot different than what ended up becoming the final episode and what ended up really just being Trek in general. I I, I like how you mentioned that this would have been a really great Outer Limits episode, especially the like that severe kind of pull the rug out like down downer ending. Yeah, Um, it opens with – a, tra- a Starfleet officer who's a drug addict and a Starfleet officer who's his dealer. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so right off the bat, Roddenberry had a view of the, sort of the perfectibility of man, that Starfleet officers were the best and the brightest and certainly aboard the Enterprise. Yes. They would not be that sort of thing. And it got – that eventually got corrupted into Roddenberry saying, you know – Ellison had my Scotty dealing drugs. Right. Well, no, he didn't. That was a sort of misremembrance of it. And yeah. even after Ellison corrected him, Roddenberry continued to tell these sort of colored versions of it. And Roddenberry would go on to say things like, you know, this script was unfilmable. And I, you know, I had to rewrite it to save it. Well, every, he did not, Roddenberry did not say every script was unfilmable as it came in on the first draft. Right. Everything had to be rewritten. Yeah. So there's things like, um, the, the, is that Beckwith? Beckwith is our criminal. Beckwith. Yes. And he's tried and he's, Kirk beams down to an is supposedly empty planet to execute him with a firing squad. Right, right. And things like that. I mean, so Starfleet. Yeah, (laughs) stuff that just is fine, but isn't Star Trek. Yeah. But I mean, who knew that back then? Nobody knew. Exactly. Look at the way Spock is portrayed in like the first 10 episodes. Yeah, right, right. right. Look at the way Bones is portrayed even sort of – Uneven as things, things were not yet gelled. As a contributor to Strange New Worlds, I'd be interested to know, 
he introduces, as you said before, this entirely new character of Beckwith. And as far as I understand, that was kind of a no-no in anthology stories. They didn't really want you to just come up with like whole cloth characters and introduce your own elements. They wanted you to work within the world that was already there. You, you could have new characters, but your well, heroes were supposed right. to be heroes. You, you couldn't kill anybody off, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, no, it's fine to have like a Charlie X or whatever, but you don't want to just sort of set somebody else up as kind of the pivotal thing or the, the, the new main character or hey, look at this guy. That's true. Although I have to say, there was a lot of flexibility in that interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> Minor characters who you saw for a split second, the girl in the swimsuit in a TNG episode where everybody forgets, loses their memories. She got a whole story. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, so there was there was some flexibility in that. But yeah, you have to play by the rules. And so Mr. Ellison's complaints um, focus on sort of two things. First is being rewritten. Well, OK, I can. I'm sorry, things have to be rewritten for the show to make it Star Trek. But also, um, Roddenberry's almost contentious need to constantly reaffirm that. Mm -hmm. Um, Roddenberry would go to conventions, and he would say, Ellison's script was unfilmable, and so that reflects poorly on Mr. Ellison, who's trying to make a living in Mm -hmm. the business. And yet, apparently it wasn't so unfilmable that he wasn't invited to pitch story ideas for Star Trek, the motion picture, one, two, three, four, and I think five as well. Roddenberry would say these things. Ellison would correct him on numerous occasions, and Roddenberry would supposedly reply, oh, you're right, I shouldn't have said that, my mistake. You know, it wasn't Scotty, it was something else. But he would then continue to do things. And I'm not an amateur, I'm not a professional psychologist, I'm not an amateur psychologist. Mm -hmm. But I can't help but wonder if some of this was... Roddenberry as a writer, as a producer, realizing that conflict is the essence of drama. And if you want to keep talking about a show and you want to keep promoting it, it's helpful to have a form of conflict. And if you're going to have a form of conflict, why not with a man whose principles are so high? Mr. Ellison brooks no no change. Um, He once mailed a dead gopher to the comptroller of a publishing company (laughs) (laughs) who violated the rules of the contract. They found an ad into the middle of one of his books, something that happened in the 60s and 70s. No, you can't. He, Mr. Ellison says he plays by the rules. It's like his integrity is of such a level that he will not allow that to be broken. And if you constantly pick at him, he will constantly pick back. Yeah. And it also seems just psychologically, as far as Roddenberry is concerned, that he definitely this was his baby and he was going to be involved in every part of it. And I think it's interesting that we I think I mentioned before that he did so much to try to legitimize Trek and to get, you know, real big deal sci-fi authors on board, you know, and have people kind of support it. And yet you can cross a line with him where he can then (laughs) defame you and get into like a very public argument with you about stuff like whatever. But then also at the same time, go, but you're going to come back and like submit stories, though, right? Mr. Ellison also saved Star Trek to a certain degree. There was a point early in the first season where things were not going good and the suits were threatening to cancel it. Yes. Roddenberry came to him and said, you got to help me. And he, Harlan Ellison created something called the committee, which had at the top of its letterhead, the biggest names A.E. Van Gogh, um, uh, Frank Herbert, um, Harlan Ellison, all these top writers. And basically it was a letter that was sent out to you know, everybody in the science fiction community saying, we finally have an adult science fiction show on TV. Mm-hmm. Suits are threatening it. Please write in, write to sponsors helping to support it. So Ellison created this amazing story, which mm-hmm. got rewritten. Okay. He helped to save Star Trek with the committee. And I'm sure from his point of view, why is Roddenberry still saying these things about me? Well, and I want to talk about Gene here in a second, but just as a guy who worked so hard to get this made, I think that he wanted it to be, I think we benefited a lot by his single mindedness of vision, but what, well, okay. You know what? Forget my comments. Let's talk about Gene's vision. Um, I don't want to tr- break the show in half right here, but Ellison as a writer can be so delving and um, transgressive in a good way, especially in works like I Have No Mouth or The Beast That Shouted Love at the Heart of the World. And he hated Roddenberry's future. Like he reportedly called it dopey utopian BS. Yeah. As, as somebody who has played in this world, like what do you think? What do you think about Gene's vision? Um, do I believe in the perfectibility of man? Well, first of all, <laughs> it's kind of like heavy. I said, first we don't have all, to break the show right here. Like, yeah, exactly. Well, first of all, there are Starfleet criminals in what, what season is court martial where somebody fakes his own death to get back at Kirk. Right. There are, there are criminals in Starfleet, but um, it doesn't work for this particular story. 
that's the thing. Um, everybody doesn't have to behave perfectly. Right. Um, I believe in a better future. I certainly believe in the, you know, once we've gotten rid of the, the pettiness of things like borders and money, we can finally concentrate on living up to the human potential. Yeah. Um, the problem with a perfectly utopian society, as we saw in like the first couple scenes of seasons of next gen is there's very little conflict. Yeah. Right. Right. So that's the real thing is that, um, Ellison's original version with the drug dealer and slash murderer creates a form of conflict. But for this story, I like bones as the point of conflict better because it's somebody I care about, somebody I relate to. It's not just another red shirt. It's like Beckwith commits this crime. He goes down, changes, changes the past. Kirk and Spock go back and yeah, they're going to get him. They're going to kill him. They're going to find it. Whatever. He's a red shirt. I don't care if it's bones who I care about and who is somebody who is good behaving through the drugs in a non good way. Right. That's a point of conflict. It's a point of, of reversal for me. It's absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to see what bones who is supposedly a good guy does. That's so bad that messes things up, but Oh no, it turns out the things he's going to do are good. Like I said, it's a great story, but it's not a Star Trek story or it's not Star Trek enough. Yeah. And that's what DC Fontana in her rewrite and mm -hmm. Roddenberry in his rewrite. This is really interesting. Re um, reading, um, Cushman's books, we see, once again, that pretty much every story went through Roddenberry's typewriter and other people's typewriters. But infrequently does he take credit. So you can't say, oh, the man was greedy, he was rewriting so he could get you know, story credits and residuals and things like that. No. Yeah, he believed in um, the sort of purity of being able to say Harlan Ellison is writing for us, Norman Spinrad, Robert Block. These people were writing for us. If, if every single episode said, you know, Teleplay by Gene Roddenberry, story by Robert Block. Right. If all of those, it would it would um, diffuse, diminish, diminish the, the 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 sense of quality. And even though he was rewriting things, it was really important to Roddenberry to have this be an adult science fiction show. To be able to say, I've got these start these new wave writers, some of the veteran science fiction writers in the field writing for me, yeah. really promoted the show. And that's not just in the purely egotistical sense. Hey, I've got a great show. It it made people more aware of it. It right. gave it more credibility. To yeah, this isn't lost in space show. here. This is, yeah, yeah, exactly. This is a grown up show. And to be able to say, I've got these writers, and to see their single name writing credits right there meant a lot to him. Yeah. I liked uh, your uh, mention of, of McCoy and the effects of his action. And it just occurred to me that it's kind of when, when you mentioned the butterfly effect, it usually refers to somebody changing something in time. Those changes propagate in unexpected ways into our future, changing our future. But even McCoy's actions are kind of a reverse butterfly effect because someone is hurt on the bridge. He comes to help them. Um, the ship is buffeted by waves. He accidentally hits himself with these drugs, drives him crazy. He goes back in time because he has the opportunity, saves somebody who shouldn't have died. And it's like it, it even propagates back to there. Just this the little, you know, for want of a nail or for want of not stabbing yourself with cortisone, like all of yeah. this stuff unfolds. It's such good structure and it's structure by committee. I have to say, this is one example where art by oh, committee yes, works. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, let's talk about that. Uh, the script did go under many revisions in order to make it filmable and also to bring it aligned with tone of the series. Uh, Ellison was asked by Roddenberry to turn in his initial treatment uh, into a shooting script. And <laughs> the story says that you know, he gave him an office on the lot to accomplish that, uh, which Ellison would lock the door. He'd blast rock music and then he wouldn't be there because he would sneak out to the set to visit during filming, I guess. Uh, supposedly, uh, at, at one time, uh, the story editor, John uh, Black, caught him on the set of Mud's Women and had to kick him off the set. Uh, eventually, he delivered a first draft, which still suffered from a lot of the same issues as the earlier treatment. And he was asked to write it again. He did and still hadn't addressed um, – unlike the note that you gave earlier, listen to the editor, uh, address the production office requests. And this is my favorite part. A week later, he turned in a revised second draft and just wrote final draft on the cover. <laughs> so, oh, that's settled. Okay, good, good. Uh, except, of course, it wasn't. Uh, producers Bob Justman and Gene Kuhn knew that they were in trouble. They'd commissioned, rewrote, and filmed other set episodes in the time it was taking to get this episode done. And apparently, they had sent William Shatner to Ellison's house to try and convince him to fix this thing. 
And depending on who you believe, and at this point, who knows, Shatner was either run off of Ellison's property or he liked the script and he spent time on Ellison's couch counting his lines in the draft to make sure he had as many as Leonard Nimoy did. And now that one's a push for me. I could believe either one of those. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of misremembering. Oh, of course. Yes. Um, my favorite misremember of all is in Joan Collins's autobiography, tellingly called Past Imperfect. Um, she apparently didn't use an editor. I'm just going to quote here, talking about her days doing television. And the Star Trek, the cult show of all time, the one I did became the most popular as Edith Cleaver, as I see, yeah. a, young, a young mission worker for down and outs in New York during the Depression. I tried to prove to the world that Hitler was OK. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Bill Shatner as Captain Kirk falls in love with me. Yeah, put put a pin in that. I want to come back to that. That's too big for right now, but okay. we'll definitely we'll we'll double back to that. Uh, in the meantime, at this point, uh, Gene Kuhn told the show's new story editor Steve Carabatzos to fix the script, uh, which essentially entailed jettisoning a lot of elements. Um, the new characters, um, the nine foot tall guardians, became a portal. Uh, but Gene didn't like it as much, so he asked Ellison to come back again and do it. And there's an, actually there's a really neat story that takes place around this time. You can find this on the website Letters of Note. Um, Isaac Asimov had written a piece for TV Guide where he criticized scientific inaccuracies in sci-fi TV shows of the day, in Star Trek in particular. And Roddenberry wrote him personally. You can see this letter on the website. And he was deferential, but he was determined. You know, He pointed out that there's, there's always going to be concessions to financial reality when making a TV show. But Star Trek was successful, and it was succeeding despite the skepticism that the show faced. And that was something to celebrate. And he sent this letter in November of 1966. And in it, he praises the contributions of Asimov and the other writers at the time to the show. And he specifically mentions that Harlan Ellison is working on a final draft of an episode and that he's uh, about a month late on it. Wow. <laughs> Uh, there's a great follow-up to exchange between them that's also on the site where months later Roddenberry is he's seeking advice from Asimov because apparently uh, Shatner is, is frustrated that even though he's the lead on the series, everybody seems to like Spock the most. And uh, does Asimov ha- have any ideas about how he can make Shatner happier with the role? And Asimov basically tells him, don't don't try to glorify or magnify either character separately. Bring bring them together. Uh, make them more of a team. Show us why they like and respect each other. And it led to a great quote from Gene in his response to that letter where he says that it's a great idea and that it will, quote, it will give us one lead, the team, unquote, which I, I think that that's so that's so Star Trek. You know, this is the episode where that really begins to show Kirk and Spock's relationship, you know, beyond merely being crewmates or officers. It's the way they rely on each other and they trust each other. They keep each other on track. They can even joke with each other about bearskins and stone knives, uh, you know, whether it's stealing some clothes or, or letting an innocent die to save millions more. Sometimes the stakes are a little higher than other times. But I think that really starts to evolve here at the end of this first season. And that's another reversal by bringing in McCoy. It's, it's that, that trinity that we have. Right. And by incorporating him as opposed to just another red shirt, we get to see a wonderful sort of – you know what's it's another thing that's great about this episode? It's, it's a fish-out-of-water episode. Yep, absolutely. Which is not something you often get in a science fiction – or at least you didn't in science fiction shows. They're usually up in space or you know, they're on other planets. Okay, that's different. No. They're in a different time in what might as well be a different world because it's Earth of the 1930s. So we're seeing them out of their comfort zone, all three of them, each reacting differently to this strange time and place. Yeah, yeah. And it's that it's that further extra layer of remove. You know, we're already watching men in the 23rd century and now they're in the, uh, the, 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 the 20th century and they're confused and we're confused about where they are. And yeah, it's great. Uh, well, believe it or not, the script still wasn't done, uh, although our discussion of it uh, almost is. Uh, just before Christmas, Ellison handed in his, and I don't know what number we're at as far as the drafts go, but Justman still didn't believe in it, and so he suggested that Roddenberry rewrite it, which he did over the holidays. Uh, Roddenberry eliminated the subplot featuring an evil Enterprise, which happens at one point, I guess because of the butterfly effect. The Enterprise is now named the Condor, and it's a completely different ship. Um which he had requested in the first place uh, of Ellison to add the Enterprise to the show. So they cut that and he added some comedy elements and Justman was mostly satisfied. But Roddenberry wasn't done. His secret weapon, former secretary and the show's new story editor, DC Fontana. And by the way, this script is on its third story editor now. <laughs> she was asked by Roddenberry to take a shot at rewriting it. And she's the one that added the element of Cordrazine and some other elements uh, but Justman lamented that it had lost something from the original version by Ellison, but they weren't going to call him again. <laughs> Roddenberry set out to revise it once more. 
Although William Shatner has suggested that Gene Kuhn was up to bat this time around, just under Roddenberry's supervision. And that version became the final shooting script. There is something that's lost that I do miss, which is there's a lot more um, development between Edith Keeler and Captain Kirk. You really yeah. could. It's, mo- it's more believable that they are in love and that, that there's actual emotions between them. More time was devoted to that in Ellison's script. This show, as screened, won the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation Science Fiction. The script written by Ellison won the Writers Guild Award. Right. Um, so between the two of them, we have sort of a perfect script. I have no problems with it as aired, but there are a few things from in, in the as written that I would like to see. I'd like to make a, a sort of mashup yeah. somehow. Yeah, um, perhaps some fan film will tackle that as long as it's under 15 minutes. Oh, how timely. Anyway, uh, uh, I don't think you could ever get away with this on a modern series. Could you? Or I don't, maybe you could. Maybe some this episode sad, of Two and a Half Men it, is floating around still somewhere. <laughs> this sad ending? Just oh, well, that, <clears throat> but also just the... Oh, oh, uh, oh, the fact that you went through... Like, the complication in production, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think almost everything um, is now a writer's room. Where sure. Yeah, sure. Might come. Um, didn't David Mack say, even though they sold a story, it still went through like a writer's room process? Yeah, where, yeah. So it's, un- it's now understood that everything is going to be reworked. Mm-hmm. Um, I think back in, the, back in the, 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 that time, I'd also be interested in knowing... Oh, I'd love to know. A tip of, give me another. Give me another show. Give me Gunsmoke. How much of that <laughs> was rewritten from a script, from the original script? But again, you're starting. It's so hard when you're starting off. But yeah, the delays wouldn't have worked. I mean, I think. Oh God, what was Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepherd? Moonlighting. Moonlighting. Moonlighting had a lot of writing problems, and so there would be like a, weeks where they, they showed an episode that had just been shown three weeks previously. <laughs> right. So, yeah, in today's world, I think everything is done by writers' rooms, and there's probably a lot more whips cracked. Oh, certainly, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if anybody would have, yeah, I don't know if anybody would have brooked 18 revisions. Yeah. I think even with this, the, the contention around um, how this episode was produced, I think it still shows, even in that time, uh, without perhaps a stereotypical writer's room, the, the strength of the production team and the management of Justman and Solo at all in that you, you can have the seed of an idea and it's going to aggregate more mass as it rolls downhill and you can end up in a completely different place than where you started with a lot of cooks, but the result is still compelling. And I think it, it proves that that's one of the secrets of Trek's success that it, it began with one one man's vision, but at, at its best, it's a it's a gestalt where a team of creative individuals are all giving their best to something. I like that. I agree with it. That's kind of my, um, my version of Gene's uh, <laughs> uh, utopian future, only from a uh, creative perspective. Um, Ellison, of course, hated the final draft. And this is where he tried to pull a chord winner bird. Can you explain to our audience what that is? Certainly. So um, if you're a writer, uh, maybe you've heard of Alan Smithy. If you're, a <laughs> yes. if you're just basically unhappy with the way something turned out in Hollywood, you can put your pseudonym. You have to have a registered pseudonym with the Writers Guild or Directors Guild right. um, on it. And if you ever see a film that says an Alan Smithy film, I think pretty much everybody uses that. Um, I think Twitter. they actually retired that technically. Oh, did they? I'm not sure that a new uh, you know, successor has been named, but I have seen a couple movies recently. Um, what's it called? Accidental Love was a uh, David O. Russell movie that kind of was abandoned. It's a long story. And he used a, a name that wasn't Alan Smithy on it um, to disown it. So Ellison was a fan of the science fiction writer Cordwainer Smith. Mm-hmm. And when he needed a name, he said, well, I'll take Cordwainer, and if I'm ever in so tr- much trouble with the story that I hate, what they've done to it, I'm going to flip on the bird. Right. So Cordwainer Bird. He threatened to use Cordwainer Bird. And Roddenberry, who once again loved the, the purity of the writing and loved the, the <laughs> quality, the, the gravitas that it brought to yes. the show. yes basically begged him not to do it and so it's yeah. like fine I'll put my name on it well you say begged I- I've heard threatened like oh. uh, apparently he gave him because like you said it was important to have that gravitas and also he wanted to send the message to other potential writers that they weren't going to screw you that they were serious about you know wanting your contributions so I you know I heard that he gave him the whole you'll never work in this town again spiel which frankly if the guy who created the lieutenant said that to me I don't think I'd be too concerned about it <laughs> but yeah either either way it worked and his name stayed on the project 
and he became famous for it. When Mr. Ellison dies, may it be many years from now, it's going to the opening lines of those opens will be you know one of the most um, you know, innovative science fiction writers of all time and author of the Star Trek episodes City on the Edge of Forever. Oh, certainly, yeah. We recently talked on the show about the episode Arena, and love that. Uh, we, me, and the guest agreed that if you're not very familiar with Trek, you probably think. That's what Trek is, you know, sweaty mm-hmm. Kirk giving a lizard man the double axe handle. <laughs> That's Star Trek. But yeah. but for fans, I think this show, the humor, the pathos, the technobabble, the time travel, godlike aliens, like this is is the thing right here. It is, but it, it's it's such a non Star Trek episode. It, it really is. Yeah, it's totally removed. I was thinking to myself, like, would I show somebody <laughs> who hadn't seen somehow Star Trek this? And normally you would say, no, no, this is kind of like um, another show. Boy, I'm just referencing myself all over. But we talked about how Darmok is a great episode, the TNG episode. But I don't, th- I don't think I'd show it to somebody who didn't know Trek because it's just not very Trek. Yeah. Once they get to the planet, and once they get to the, through the portal, it's a very quiet episode. It's about oh, yeah, four sir- people in the Lower East Side of New yeah. York yeah, during right. the Great Depression. Yeah, just sweeping up. But – it's that gentleman, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why it's so beloved. It's that directness and gentleness. It's more relatable. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. N- None of us have fought Klingons, but we all know somebody, or maybe ourselves, who've had to work as a janitor, who's trying <laughs> to work on something, who's fallen in love, who's fallen in love with somebody it's not going to work out. Yeah, right. It's a quiet, gentle, intimate episode that plucks at our heartstrings. There I say it. Yeah. This is a question totally out of nowhere. Is this the first time that a bridge panel explodes and kills or incapacitates someone? I don't, um, I don't know. I was trying to look that up and I found a, like a Trek BBS thread from like seven years ago where I think they would agree with me. But that becomes such a staple, especially in the you know cinematic efforts where we have to create tension. But I still wonder why they use these computers that blow up when they uh, something goes wrong. And also, they're constantly getting buffered around by um, the, the time the time waves. Right. There's not a good time for seatbelts. Now is the time for seatbelts. Yeah, this is it. This is exactly it. Uh, I'd like to talk about DeForest Kelly as McCoy in this episode. Since he spends a lot of it off screen, I mean, you can't really call it a showcase for him, but he's great here. And it's not just when he's going full Charlie Sheen on us. It, mm. It's also later when he's coming down and like when he's in the mission and uh, he's like, I'm probably hallucinating all this, but what the hell? It's it's fun. Like. I just like the, that he can be insane and he can have fun with it at the same time. And I think I read somewhere that maybe in an earlier draft, they kind of had an angle where he sort of falls in love with Edith Keeler as well. I think the Forrest Kelly said it was his idea to have him sort of fall in love oh, with Oh, or to play it that way. To play it that way. Okay. There's, there's something I call the of course moment. And that's one of the reasons, again, why I prefer it to be um, – Dr. McCoy, then say a red shirt. Yes. The the of course moment is when your character behaves so perfectly. You go, of course, that's what he would say. Of course, that's what he would do. Sure. Yeah. And because we've gotten to know Bones over the course of 20 some odd episodes, when he's doing that thing where it's like, I know that you're an illusion because clearly I'm hallucinating. You're like, of course, that's exactly. But I'm a Southern gentleman. Yeah, right. (laughs) I love that. I love those of course moments. And you get those with characters who are established, characters you identify with, characters you know how they're supposed to act. That's why I like using the established characters as opposed to bringing in unknowns. But again, Dr. McCoy probably hadn't been fleshed out at all. when the Yeah. Well, he was still a featured player at that point. He wasn't. Yeah. That's right. yeah. I'm curious then. So do you think that wouldn't have worked with Beckwith clearly, but if they had swapped Beckwith for Riley or, or somebody else and given somebody else a chance to sort of develop a little more, do you think that that would have worked? It might've worked. Better, but it wouldn't have worked nearly as well. Oh, we haven't talked about the other thing that got changed. Oh, okay. Which is that in the original drafts, this is one of the things Ellison was most upset about. Spock stops Beckwith. So Spock is the one who lets her die, not Kirk. Kirk found, found himself unable to do it. Kirk was going to let her live. Yes. Going to let the universe fall apart. Due to his love. And a lot of people say, well, that's, you know, an amazing statement about the power of love and all that. You know, a lot of people say, um, you know, it's the expected thing that your hero, Captain Kirk, would. Right, like, right. Would, 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 you know, give all that up. It's like, no, it's a greater thing if, if he, if he, you know, lets the universe go to hell so he can have his lady love. And it's like. Right. And it, for, mm-hmm. it foreshadows the idea of, of course, the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the one. Mm hmm. So I think that Kirk stopping McCoy and letting her die is 
a, a better dramatic choice. That brings us to Joan Collins as Edith. Uh, I have to say that I've never really seen her films of the time or before. And I mean, I wasn't really a Dynasty fan when it was on, but but she's great here. She's got a tough job. Um, you said you're not totally convinced. I'm on the other side of that. I think in about half a script, she's got to appeal to Kirk, be a foil for him, make us mourn as Kirk does when she dies, and really believe that he would. And I think they get as close as you can in the time that they really had. That's your opinion. And you're not convinced. <laughs> I'm still not convinced. I do <laughs> like her as a... Uh, Ellison said he models her on Amy Semple McPherson. The, right, right. Who the, people? The, the, I like her. I like her as an evangelist. I like her speaking lines that Roddenberry put in and that Ellison called utopian BS about <laughs> right. the ability of man. And someday things will get better. Things will. Things are bad. They will get better. Yeah, that absolutely. I really do buy her as a as you know as a mission worker. Um, you know, I don't buy the love story. But as somebody that Kirk just me. For. Yeah, okay. I, I'm look. I'm a cold hearted uh, bastard, I'm, and I should well. <laughs> and, I'm emotionally closed off. So there uh, go. yeah, like a Vulcan. Uh, yeah, I should yeah, mention yeah. for if listeners don't know, Amy Semple McPherson was a Pentecostal evangelist um, of that time of the 20s and 30s, known as Sister Amy. And you know, maybe they ran out of time. You mentioned her um, sort of enlightened ideas and her, the, you know, preaching peace. The problem that I have is that the show never gets a chance or never really tries to reconcile the idea that this woman is going to be so successful in preaching peace that America actually sits out World War II, which sounds great and it sounds in line with Federation philosophy. But this was a show written by a World War II veteran in the early days of Vietnam. Like, she's got to go. That's not going to work. But there's that wonderful exchange between Kirk and Spock where Kirk is like, she has to die. And uh, because she would meet with FDR and that would um, encourage pacifism and, and right. time, America would sit out World War II long enough for the Nazis to develop the bomb first. And Spock says, you know, she was right. Peace is the way. It was just the right message at the wrong time. Yeah. <laughs> that there Which, is a time for, for war. Yeah. Well, it, but yeah. And I think that even in the, the late 80s, early 90s, I think TNG would have a harder time saying that. But this is – this is 1967. They they got no problem saying no. There's just wars. There's just wars for sure. I'm reminded of the episode of The Simpsons, which is about war. And at the end, Bert, Bart turns to the camera and says, "I think we learned an important lesson here. War is bad, with three exceptions: uh, the American Revolution, World War II, and the Star Wars trilogy." <laughs> I think that's I think that's our first Simpsons reference on the show, uh, mixed with a Star Wars reference. So that's getting cut out. No, uh, I. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned the the not the Hitler thing before. I don't know if this is like a real element. Or if Joan was just riffing, uh, but like you said, she she suggested that that uh, maybe Edith was a Nazi sympathizer, but like in the vein of a of a Charles Lindbergh, you know, America staying out of foreign affairs type way. And again, is my opinion on that is that Roddenberry has a distinguished flying cross. That's not going to be in the text. There's no way he's going to let something like that uh, go and be the woman that Kirk falls in love with. But I wonder that if, as a girl who grew up in London while the bombs were falling, you know, Joan Collins. If that was maybe just a character grace note that she added and then maybe got inflated kind of over time as something that was actually like really part of it. That's kind of my crackpot theory for this episode, because otherwise I don't know what she's talking about. I think she's misremembering. Yeah, well, probably. She probably enjoyed the 1970s Hollywood to the fullest possible extent. Sure. Yeah. OK. They caught her on a bad day. I get it. And even worse, she didn't have a good editor. That's Somebody true. She should have caught that. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, just one more Ellison story before we wrap up. You mentioned before, I think that uh, the teleplay, Ellison's original teleplay uh, for The City on the Edge of Forever won the Writers Guild Award for the best episodic drama on TV. This is 1968. Ellison submitted his, his original version of the script uh, out of spite, according to uh, Bob Justman, uh, although he may have just wanted to get the recognition he felt he deserved. And it was actually up against the return of the Archons another first season episode of Trek. And Gene Kuhn supposedly remarked at the time that uh, we have two scripts up for an award and I wrote them both. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Roddenberry was, was credited for the story, but Kuhn did the final uh, script from his idea. And during the ceremony, the Desilu group was at one table and Ellison was at another. And when Ellison won, the Desilu people stood up and cheered. They were excited because, again, they were trying to legitimize their series and trying to support uh, what was going on. And Ellison gets up there and he starts ranting about studio interference and people meddling and he, he's brandishing his copy of the script and apparently he concluded it by shouting, never let them rewrite you! <laughs> Which is so him. Um, he just really has to pave his own way. And I'm not sure that he has ever... 
not begrudgingly accepted an edit. He must. I mean, clearly he has as a writer, but the fact that you gave us such good advice about about listening to editors and then you have a guy like this who, like you said, hopefully he will be with us for many years. But when he goes, his list of accomplishments is so long. I'm having some cognitive dissonance on how that might work. These are two men with very strong individual visions. Mm -hmm. And they cannot mesh perfectly. Perhaps not. If one is going to work for the other, if one is going to work towards fulfilling the other's vision, there's going to be conflict. And you have to bend and you have to flex perhaps more than Mr. Ellison was willing to do. And Roddenberry had the, he had the final typewriter. That's true. That's true. It was, he was going to see that last. I yeah. wonder, I've never actually read the, um, the published version of uh, Ellison's script, but I'm definitely going to check it out after this. But there's, there's something that a big question that I have, there's a line in the episode, which I love and I bet Ellison would hate. And I wonder who it came from. Um, I guess if he h- hated it, he probably would have wouldn't have written it. <laughs> oh, not him. But it's the interchange between him and Keeler, uh, Kirk and Keeler, about uh, about how you know the three best words in the English language isn't "I love you." It's it's "Let me help." Yeah, I don't know who put that in. Yeah, but I, yeah, I bet you it was DC Fontana or Gene Roddenberry. Yeah, possibly. Well, anyway, uh, I think we covered just about everything there, and hopefully we'll get out of this intact. Did you have any uh, last thoughts or parting shots about the episode? No, I think we've covered pretty much everything. We pretty much, pretty much have I think it well. boils down to somebody was hired to, to write a story. That story did not jive perfectly with the, with the producer's vision. It got rewritten, and the real shame is that for decades afterwards there was still conflict yeah. from people telling uh, f- from my point of view i think roddenberry was perhaps in the wrong um c- continuing to criticize and to promote himself over ellison and because ellison was the man he is he was not going to take it and so it kept this sore alive this fight alive right and it became a thing within fandom yeah, and up until even just a couple years ago, um, Ellison sued Paramount for uh, compensation that he felt like he wasn't getting for the continued marketing of the Guardian and Elements and things like that in uh, Paramount's uh, releases. I do know that Peter David, who's friends with um, Harlan Ellison, asked um, Mr. Ellison for permission before he did stuff with him. Oh, I see. Okay, sure, sure. So at the very, at the very least, some some people were reaching out and trying to to mediate that. Yeah. Well, I, this wasn't meant to be a referendum on Ellison. Th- this no. episode, um, but I think I just have to reiterate again that I think Roddenberry was right. That Trek is amazing in that you know, sure, it's easy to look back after fifty years and say, of course, it was always going to be successful. But th- they didn't know that, and you have to marvel at the efforts of everybody involved, including Ellison, at bringing something so affecting and enduring into the world. We're talking about its TV show from 50 years I ago. I know, I know. And it's changed America, it's changed world culture. Yeah. And this is, as a lot of people view it, as the best episode of that. Is this your favorite episode? <sighs> it's the top three of original series. I love Arena. Yeah, that's Just because I love Chris Sweaty Kirk yeah. beating the Gorn. <laughs> And and I love Trouble with Tribbles. Everybody has three of your favorite episodes. So you need to forever and Trouble with Tribbles. Yep, I think those are yep, those are the, the big three, I think, as far as I'm concerned as well. There's the story structure in Arena is a little less impressive than yeah, well. the Tribbles and City of Edge Forever. But between the three of them, you get all the stuff you want. You get the pathos, you get the action, you get the humor, you get the science fiction y stuff. It's all there. Yep. Well, let's talk My Space Dad can beat up your space dad. Who's your favorite captain and why? That's a false dichotomy. Really. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, I grew up with Kirk, and I really appreciate um, Picard uh, season four and on. Not the first three seasons. You've read. <laughs> um, oh, man. Do you, do you go with, like, the guy who was your dad, or you'd go with, like, the wise old uncle who was really cool? <laughs> That's uh, the question. I, you know... I don't know. Am I the first person to say I don't know? You abstain. Uh, you might be. Yeah, actually. IDIC, infinite diversity and infinite combination. That's true. That's true. I love them both. You could always uh, swerve and say uh, Pike or uh, uh, Garth of Izar or something like that too. <laughs> 
Uh, well, now that the show is over, you'll receive a commission at the rank of ensign. What department on the ship would you work on? Oh, stellar cartography. Hmm, interesting. Why? If you've seen Generations, you remember how incredibly awesome that room was. You're yeah. basically in Google Street View for the galaxy. Right, yeah. And they tried to replicate that a little bit on a TV budget in Voyager, too. They had the stellar cartography lab. Yeah, but... So basically, you can sit back in your chair and go anywhere in the galaxy you want. Like, right. Ooh, ooh, that's cool. That would be an awesome job. And there's like one chair, so I assume you work alone <laughs> if that's how you want to work, too. Where's Kevin? Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> I'm yeah, on right. bars. <laughs> You should see what they did to the 7-Eleven down there. Four years ago, it was nothing. Now it's a giant thing. It's amazing. I love <laughs> Galaxy Street View. But all the space cars license plates are blurred out, though. So. <laughs> well, Anson Lauderdale, thanks for joining me to talk about Star Trek and the Star Trek universe. If people want to continue the conversation, and they can, at at EIST Pod on Twitter and the Enterprising Individuals Facebook page, where can people find you online? I am such a Luddite. I am online, and it's not as bad as if it was a MySpace page, <laughs> but Kevin Lauderdale dot live journal. <laughs> ah, the venerated not, live journal. It's not my fault. By the time the internet, by the time I, I was aware of the internet, Lauderdale dot com, as you can imagine, had been taken. Oh, sure, sure. So Probably um, by Florida, I'm guessing? Yeah, Florida or the university. <laughs> yes. Or, you take your pick. Uh, also dot org dot net. <laughs> Right. That's where I am. And I post whenever I have, um, if I have a story up, I'll, I'll post a link there. Every time there's a new episode of presenting the transcription feature, I don't think I gave the name of my podcast. Oh, yes. My old time radio show. It's called Presenting the Transcription Feature because old time shows that were recorded were said to have been transcribed. So every time there's an episode of that, I post links up there. Um, I have a public Facebook page. You can go there. I'm the one who has crazy stuff about old time radio and Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, people should go check that out. Don't feel too bad. I still have an AOL email address. Wow. Well, I've had it for so long, and it's like, what if somebody that I knew way in the way back wants to get a hold of me? Like, that's, I just keep it open. Yep, that's the, that's the thing. Like, if, you, if I wrote something, if I sent something to an editor 16 years ago, and I had my old, my, you know, my one email address on, I don't want to right. change it in case they're digging through their files and go, you know who would be really good for this? Kevin Lauderdale. It's a long <laughs> shot, but you're right. <laughs> Is this email still up? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> well, thanks again for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. We are signing off until the next mission, hailing frequencies closed. So